And the second part of the program, our panel discussion, learning from one another, the legacy of the Holocaust in health professions education. To introduce our panel, we have Dr. Mark Levine. Dr. Levine is a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, as well as a faculty associate at the university's Center for Bioethics and Humanities, where he is also a member of the Holocaust Genocide and Contemporary Bioethics Advisory Group. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, thank you, Malia, for uh, that kind introduction. And thank you to all of our attendees for your uh, attention to this very important program. And, and thank you, Matt, for, uh, again, a wonderful presentation on um, the perspective of the Holocaust uh, in contemporary perspective for the medical profession. Um, our uh, program at the Anschutz campus of the University of Colorado is the Holocaust, Genocide, and Contemporary Bioethics. And we do a lot of teaching, not only to physicians, but also to many other health professions, including uh, nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, physical therapy, uh, the whole uh, range. And uh, our panel discussion today is going to focus upon aspects of the Holocaust and its contemporary implications for professions other than uh, medicine or including medicine, but also focusing on nursing, dentistry, and psychology uh, and their um, uh, perspective on uh, the history of the Holocaust and lessons that are appropriate for uh, uh, teaching in those um, uh, circumstances. Um, our panelists uh, are, include um, uh, three wonderful experts in different fields. Uh, from the field of nursing, we are uh, very pleased to have Darcy Copeland, who is an RN and PhD at uh, Associate Professor of Nursing at the University of Northern Colorado, um, an expert in workforce issues for nurses and the roles of nurses in the Holocaust. Our dental expert is uh, Mathis Krischel, who's a PhD and lecturer in the history of medicine and medical ethics um, at um, the University of, uh, sorry, um, uh, University of Dusseldorf uh, in Germany. He has worked with the German uh, Dental Association who have sponsored his research in the history of dentistry in the Nazi era. And in the field of psychology, we are pleased to have Linda Wolf, uh, who is a professor not only of psychology, but also of international human rights at the Webster University in St. Louis. Um, her area of expertise is in genocide, torture, and uh, has been uh, recognized as a distinguished teacher of psychology from the American Psychological Foundation. Um, our moderator for this uh, panel uh, has asked to change his hats, although he's not wearing one at the moment. Uh, and it's of course, uh, Matt Winnia, the um, uh, professor of medicine and director of the Center for Bioethics at the University of Colorado. So Thanks take so it much. away, Matt. Yeah, yes. thank you, Mark. And I am so pleased. I'm, I'm really excited to get this started. So I'm going to kick things right off. Um, Linda, do you mind if I jump to you first? Um, I'd like each of you uh, to say a word about what do you think from the perspective of someone in the field of psychology, in the field of dentistry, in the field of nursing, what are the core aspects of this history that like you shouldn't graduate um, if you haven't been exposed to at least that. Um, and, and I realize there might be a lot there, but you know, if in three to five minutes you could tell us what do you think are the core sort of learning objectives, the core things that people ought to know about the roles of our different aspects of the health professions um, in terms of participation in this history. Well, thanks, Matt. And uh, thank you for the invitation to present today. And uh, I want to acknowledge Holocaust Remembrance 
day. It is such an important um, day to mark, particularly as we're going through times of Holocaust denial uh, and a rise in anti-Semitism in the country, certainly in the United States, but also part, parts of Europe, et cetera. You know, I'd love to say that psychology somehow escaped the Holocaust, because if you look at the years of where, you know, people were being killed, you don't see psychology pop up very often. Instead, you see psychoanalysts who were in prison because there were so many Jewish psychoanalysts. Um, certainly psychiatrists uh, were absolutely involved in the killing. But psychology laid the roots for it. And so what I want students to recognize is the role of psychology and particularly IQ tests as a tool of social engineering that was designed to harm people. Um, and it, it was used for processes of sterilization in the United States, which were then taken by the Nazis. If you look at the work of Henry Goddard in writing about the Kalakak family, I think it is Kalakak family was a family that they followed the generations. It was the good father who married the lovely Quaker woman who had this wonderful line of family, uh, but he also had an affair with the barmaid. And two to six generations out were nothing but defective people, according to Goddard. And he says it's all heredity. Um, and so I, you know, we often idolize these famous names in our field. Um, but Goddard should not be idolized for the work that he did because he helped set up all the immigration quotas at Ellis Island that kept people from escaping. And I just want to quote Lewis Terman. Uh, Terman was a psychologist who helped develop uh, one of the major tests that's still used today. And this is what he wrote. High grade or borderline deficiency is a very, very common thing among Spanish Indian and Mexican families of the Southwest and also among Negroes. Their dullness seems to be racial or at least inherent in the family stocks from which they come. Children in this group should, should be segregated into separate classes. They cannot master abstractions, but they can often be made into efficient workers. From a eugenic point of view, they constitute a grave problem because of their unusually prolific breeding. So the roots of racism were built into so much of psychometrics, which were then used to guide Nazi policies as well. And so I think students need to learn the full history of our disciplines, the things that we did well, but the places where we've created great harm. And I should note that here we are in, in 2022, and just now the American Psychological Association has passed anti-racism resolutions and apologies to people of color for the harms that were done. It took that long for the apologies to begin to happen. You know, uh, your answer really calls it into, uh, or lights, illuminates the many connections between the international scientific community and the German uh, scientific community. Mm -hmm. So obviously these things were, you know, th these, racial policies uh, were not originated in Germany. In some cases, they were exported to Germany or imported to Germany. Um, but uh, Mathis, would you mind going next and telling us from the perspective of dental medicine, um, what, are the, what are the issues? What are the things that you tend to try and emphasize in your teaching? Yes, of course. And uh, I would like to thank you for having me and I would like to thank for the kind introduction and for you organizing a symposium like this. Um, so I think what I want the dental students that I teach to know is that dentists were involved in many of the same crimes as physicians in Nazi Germany. So for example, they were involved in the persecution and exclusion of Jewish and and politically unopportune colleagues, about one in 10 dentists in Germany was forced out of the profession. That's a little bit, a uh, little fewer than in medicine in general, but still it's, it's a huge part of the profession and even a bigger part in some cities like Munich or Frankfurt or Berlin. And at the same time, we know that many, many dentists voluntarily joined the Nazi party. So we know 
that professors of dentistry at German universities uh, joined up at a rate of about 60%, so more than, more than one in two. Um, we also know that dentists reported people with physical disabilities, including cleft lip and cleft palate to be sterilized under the um, forced sterilization law. So the majority of patients who were sterilized were um, sterilized for psychiatric or neurological conditions, but physical disabilities were also an indication and in, in the realm of, of cleft lip, lip and cleft palate, we see that. And we know that quite a few um, dentists joined the SS and in that capacity, they helped to run the concentration and extermination camps. They provided um, dental service for the guards of the camps. They supervised the prisoner dentists. They also supervised the robbery of dental gold, which as you pointed out in your lecture, started in the, in the T4 um, murders of people with disabilities and which was carried out in a quite systematic fashion in the mass murders in the extermination camps. And we know that um, very large amounts of gold were uh, brought to Berlin, uh, individual uh, concentration camp dentists and some guards kept um, many pounds of gold for themselves. So I would like my students to know this, and I think it's especially important because not much of this was known in the post-war years. Um, while with the Nuremberg Medical Doctors' Trial, um, at least there was some idea that physicians had been involved in many of these crimes. None of the defendants had been a dentist. And even when in the 1960s in the, in the uh, Auschwitz trial held in Frankfurt, one dentist was sentenced to a couple of years in jail as accessory to murder for participating in the selection of prisoners on the ramp. Even then, the dental community in Germany didn't really understand that these crimes concerned them. Um, and this is a story that went on much, much longer than in many other parts of medicine in Germany when in the 1980s, some people were starting to question the involvement of German medicine. There were a few dentists, but really the professional organizations took much longer than in many other parts of, of medicine or nursing to, to really address this issue. And for that reason, only in 2019, a colleague of mine from Aachen and I myself could um, conclude a project that was funded by the German Dental Association in which we um, could finally find out more about the involvement of perpetrator dentists as well as um, the, the destinies of um, more than 1,100 dental surgeons and 3,000 dental personnel in total who were persecuted, excluded if they couldn't flee, murdered in Nazi Germany. Uh, yeah, just uh, striking how, um, you know, along with Dr. Wolf's comment about how long it took for psychology to wrap its head around um, the implications and the legacies of this history, um, I think all, all of our professional groups have faced that, you know, to one degree or another. It's, uh, it's really hard to figure out what to do uh, with this history today. Um, Darcy Copeland, would you mind telling us uh, within the nursing field, um, what do you emphasize? What aspects of this history do you find to be most important when, when training a new nursing professional? Sure, and as with the other panelists, thank you for inviting me um, to this panel and this, this talk in general. Um, I, so nursing is potentially different than these other disciplines, um, dentistry and, and medicine, um, in that we have different levels of education. We can be practicing nurses at a baccalaureate level. We could be practicing nurses at a, at a master's level, at a, at a doctoral level. Um, so there is, in, in my work, there is some kind of leveling of information <laughs> that sort of occurs with respect to this information. And I, I, I kind of see two different paths um, or two different 
sets of information as being really important for nurses. So on one hand, my background is in psychiatric and mental health nursing. Um, and I mean, you, you touched on the T4 program and the period of wild euthanasia. And as with medicine, you know, medicine you mentioned has kind of a, a history of being a profession of curing. Nursing has a history as being a profession of caring. Um, and yet somehow during these periods of uh, the T4 program and wild euthanasia, something happened there. Um, and I, I just really want to emphasize for some of the folks who might have been on the, the previous uh, presentation, Matt didn't get into a lot of details, um, but, but literally what happened during the, period, the T4 period is you know, small psychiatric facilities across Germany, physicians were asked to identify patients who ought to be eliminated. And those patients were put on buses with nurses, they were called charitable ambulances, with nurses, with all of their belongings. And those nurses accompanied these patients to these T4 centers, you know, took them off the bus and essentially walked them into um, gas chambers where a physician would, um, would kill them using carbon monoxide. Um, nurses would then get back on their buses, their empty buses, and return to their facilities. So these psychiatric, and there were psychiatric nurses working at these T4 centers as well. Uh, five of the six T4 centers were psychiatric hospitals. One was a prison. Um, then as that program got phased out um, and the period of like wild euthanasia started, again, physicians were responsible for identifying patients to be eliminated, but it was nurses who literally walked those patients down a hall to a room designated as the killing room and administered poison either orally or injecting it, um, all with the kind of understanding in their head that they were somehow, you know, curing these people of their misery or I mean, I, I don't want to put myself in their heads, but um, they thought they really thought what they were doing was the right thing to do while they were actively murdering another human being. Um, so, I mean, we could, I think it's important for, for people to understand that kind of history. Um, and you know, fl flash forwarding to mental health care in the United States uh, many years later, I, I think where I sort of got interested in that was, it's, it's always been at the top of my mind that when we, as an inpatient mental health nurse, we do a lot of making determinations about what behaviors are acceptable and who ought to be allowed to leave and who needs to be involuntarily um, medicated, who needs to be involuntarily restrained. We make a lot of decisions about what to do with people's bodies against their will. Um, and I don't think those decisions should be made lightly. But we're making those decisions just as, as happened during the period of Nazi uh, Germany with the idea of kind of public good often in mind. I mean, often it's, you know, we're looking out for individual harm too, but the other aspects, I'll try to be really quick here, that I think it's important for nurses to understand in terms of professionalization, we are a much younger profession than medicine. Um, and we it's just a different history. Um, we have, you know, we have the role of women in society. Um, it was the Nazis literally needed nurses because number one, they were close to the public the German public trusted nurses and we were obedient. Like that was a criteria for being a nurse at the time was to be obedient, oh. particularly to physicians. So I think the other kind of big lesson is kind of a lesson in our own professionalism and what can happen when the state, when medicine, when other others um, kind of come in and, and patrol our 
our values and our standards and our ethics and professional being. I was going to follow up, but your first point, I think, is really fascinating. Um, that these are the people at the bedside who do have this uh, legacy of caring at the very individual level. And the idea, you know, uh, physicians sort of somehow were able to cast what they were doing as good for the body politic, even if it was bad for this, uh, you know, this particular trillion cells standing in front of me, but I'll get rid of that trillion cells if it helps the larger, right? It's the purulent appendix. Do you, do you see that kind of language within the nursing um, sort of language at the time, the idea of um, nurses as, as having an explicit role in protecting the body politic as a, and not any longer this role of protecting any given individual insofar as that individual may be in conflict with the good of the, of the larger whole? Um, yes, that language, the language of the body politic definitely exists in nursing. And I should mention that um, one of the laws that was passed um, once Hitler came into power was to take all nursing schools under the control of the state. Under the control of the state, it was largely physicians who were teaching nurses. As you mentioned, roughly 50% of physicians were also members of the Nazi party. So the, 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 nursing, the nursing education and values that were going out there were ideas of eugenics and um, ideology of the state and public health and physicians. They were, they were one and the same in yeah. my readings. Yeah. What, uh, Linda, do you see that in the psychology literature as well, that, that there was this notion um, that the the role of the profession as an agent of the state becomes just much more important in this time. And by the way, in the 40 years leading up to this time frame too, right? So we're not just talking about the Nazi era here. What's interesting is a lot of people associate psychology with clinical work and mental health care. And that actually took off after World War II uh, with a growing need for individuals to be able to provide that sort of care. Uh, but where we've seen it more is later uh, during the torture uh, era following 9-11 and psychologists' involvement in torture, where the state became um, those that we are trying to protect and keep safe. And prisoners were, you know, their human rights were uh, completely violated. And it wasn't just a few um, you know, bad actors. Uh, a lot of the policies came through the American Psychological Association's ethics office uh, and the desire to keep it safe, effective, and legal. But the legal part was tricky because torture had been defined as, um, you know, organ defect or death. So waterboarding used as torture in Cambodian by the Nazis was not considered torture. Uh, but psychologists were heavily involved in that. So we've seen it later where they're supposed to be providing care, but sometimes they're getting information about fears that could be used against prisoners. Um, there's a question came through in the chat, in the Q and A that I'd love to ask while we have Linda and Darcy right next to each other on my screen, at least. What's the psychological status or state of nurses in this period? Do you, Linda, do you care to hypothesize about the, or maybe between the two of you, we could get a, a psychological profile of nurses in during this dictatorship period. I would imagine you're, you're looking at a lot of, um, you know, cognitive dissonance, uh, where this became the morally right and correct thing to do for your community, your family, and so you morally disengage from. You know, the individuals who are being killed, they are no longer viewed as human. And you come up with a variety of rationales, uh, you know, why it's so important to do. Um, so, for example, you know, it's you're not killing human beings, but you're you're removing that tumor from the body of Germany. And this is something that's necessary to do to protect your home, your family and community. And in the long haul, from a eugenics perspective, it will make a much better world. 
So I'd, I'd be interested in Darcy, what do you think? I would, in, in many ways, I would lump nurses in with, yes, a, a profession, um, but just to the larger context of Germany. Germany at the time was extremely patriarchal. Um, so, I mean, the role of women in society was literally to have babies and teach children. Like that was, that was what women were expected to do. So the, the sort of prof professionalization of women was relatively young. Um, so, I mean, I could imagine if I was a new sort of up and coming professional woman in what was literally very much a man's world, I would, I mean, you have maybe you have to sort of tread lightly. Like I'm not going to be the woman out there raising, you know, raising cane to to buck systems that had been established for decades. Um, so I think I think that's an important piece of it. I think that they were the the rise of nationalism in general, the economic depression that was you know, the recovery that was happening after that, they were a part of all of that as well um, as being a part of this relatively new professionalization that was at the time still very much dictated by physicians. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Krischel, what was the status of uh, dentists at the time? Well, dentists had been a much newer profession than physicians in Germany. So traditionally, many um, dental practitioners had not attended university, but they had been educated in a, in a dental lab, and then they could do some examination to treat patients. And only from about the time after the First World War, German medical schools started to offer programs in dentistry. So in 1933, um, when the Nazis were elected to power, um, there were about 10,000 academic dentists in Germany and about 18,000 skilled dentists. And um, it might be one of the reasons why um, academic dentists, dental surgeons, um, might have had reasons to fall in line with the Nazi party because they actually wanted to bring this other group of skilled dentists under their professional control, much in the same way as, as nurses had been put under the control of, of physicians in Germany uh, already in the 19th century. Um, that was not the case yet. So actually dental surgeons were competing for patients with skilled dentists. Um, um, and academic dentists were arguing that, that their skilled colleagues without academic degrees were lowering the prices. Um, and I think in that situation, um, academic dentists were starting to, to make some arguments along the line of we are working for the public health of the whole German people and um, we want to contribute to public health. We can contribute to eugenic efforts and things like that. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, so uh, fascinating. Um, are there? We, we're getting a bunch of questions and and had some in the earlier session as well around links from this history to issues that we're facing today, in particular around uh, the pandemic, but I assume there are others interested, well, there are several also interested in issues around uh, racism, inequities, uh, you know, is it possible that, uh, it, you know, attempts to try and address inequities by looking at races is a reflection of a similar kind of thinking, or is that a response to this kind of thinking? Right. These these things are being raised in the uh, in the chat, and I wonder if um, if any of you would like to to say a word about. And I I should probably call on someone because I think this is a a, a difficult question. So I'll go to Darcy first because uh, <laughs> I've known Darcy the longest. <laughs> so. Um, so you might be willing to, yeah, to go out on a limb. What's the issue today that you think is, is most illuminated by this history? 
Um, yes, and let me get to that, but I, I want to just put a, another point of just kind of historical accuracy because, you know, there might be people out there with this knowledge. Prior to nursing education being assumed by the state and physicians, um, the other way nurses were trained was primarily through like Protestant um, service, like with, with an emphasis on service and obedience. So, oh. so that was an element too. So we have this sort of combination of service and obedience that then sort of transferred into under the leadership of physicians. So I just want to clarify that real quick. Yeah. So when I share this information with students and have conversation with students, um, you know, we certainly talk about uh, kind of I, issues of sort of scapegoating and dehumanizing and othering essentially stigmatizing other people, which is something we know happens in nursing. But what comes up for students inevitably in every class I've ever had this discussion, um, and it's even now, it's, it's so far not COVID, it's immigration. Um, students are inevitably able to point to, huh, you know, there's some things going on at our southern border that sort of remind me of you know, some scapegoating and othering and the language that we're using about immigrants crossing our Southern border is, has been my experience. Huh. Linda, what, what's your experience? You and I have talked about this before, but it was all in the context years ago of the torture program of right. the CIA and, the, and uh, at Guantanamo, where, you know, those connections seemed pretty obvious. That, that seems to have receded into the background, although there are still issues around that. Um, what, what do you see as the, the, the area where there's the greatest resonance today? For me, it's, you know, if we look back into the history and the development of things such as IQ tests, um, it was an attempt to move, <clears throat> you know, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Black, uh, you know, anti-Indigenous, sort of ideas from a realm of just not liking them and prejudice and stigmatizing and, and uh, discrimination to one of scientific racism. So we're not racist and the science tells us that whites, Christians, largely Protestants, male are the norm. Heterosexual, cisgender, that's the norm. And everything else is different and less than. Uh, and I think we're still working to overcome that legacy because we talk about, you know, even if you look at demographics, you know, white, black, you know, you have these very distinct categories and then other, and there's nothing about intersectional, intersectionality, um, you know, uh, the common links between people, but, you know, every, I, I still, you know, we see it in popular culture, but, how many TV shows about cowboys and Indians do we need to get rid of before we start making progress? I mean, this is still part of our main street culture um, and it carries over into classes and, and people's implicit biases. Some of them have explicit biases, but also their implicit biases. And certainly it plays out at the border because if they were coming from Canada, we wouldn't have these issues, but they're coming across the Southern border and they're different based on what is defined as race. Yeah. Mathis, what would you say is the, are the, are the echoes today that are most resonant with, with the students that you interact with or with dental practitioners for that matter that you may interact with? So let me try to give two examples. One is a bit more abstract and then the second one will be quite concrete. So for the more abstract one, um, I found a very recent issue of the AMA Journal of Ethics on inequity along the medical dental divide. And ah. it's mostly focusing on the American setting and talking about how um, general physicians don't usually um, investigate diseases of the, of the jaw and the mouth and how health insurance is uh, maybe sub, even more suboptimal for dental health than for, for general health. And in that context, I was thinking about how in Germany, after the First World War and before the Nazis came to power, there was 
quite decent dental public health. There were clinics run by public health insurers, and it was really reasonably easy for people to get access to, to decent dental, dental health care. And that is something that became quite a bit harder after the Nazis came to power, because it, as a favor for falling in with the regime, um, dental surgeons got the, got the Nazi party to close those polyclinics, those public health insurance run clinics, and to, um, to rely much, much more on uh, dentists in individual practice, which made it harder for some parts of society to access dental health care. So in, in this regard, we are seeing that the story is a little bit different than in many other parts of public health, where the Nazis were really, really trying to improve public health. But for dental health, really, um, you can see that access became much harder. And instead of giving people access to, to public dental health care, to um, school dental clinics, they were printing brochures telling them to, to eat stale rye bread instead of white bread, because that would be good for Germanic teeth. So that is one aspect. Um, the other aspect is much more current in, in German politics. Over the last year or so during the pandemic, we have seen in the beginning a few people and now even more people who are criticizing um, vaccination and vaccination policies. We still don't have a mandate in Germany to be vaccinated, but parliament is debating it at the moment and it's very likely to come. And we can see some people, it's maybe about five or 10% of the population who is strongly opposed to vaccination and they are out in the street, they are demonstrating, they are making themselves heard. And of this group, a small minority is putting on yellow stars that say unvaccinated. And there has been a debate in the press and many people, including historians, including myself, find that quite inappropriate. And I think knowing more about the crimes in Nazi Germany, knowing more about persecution, knowing more about Nazi health policy, which did actually include vaccination mandates is very important in, in answering those people in public forums, in the media, in newspapers, on Twitter, wherever you might encounter them. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there, the same issue sometimes arises around the abortion debate, for example, where people assume that, uh, but actually people on both sides sometimes assume that the other side is acting like Nazis. And, and in fact, they kind of both have a point in that the Nazis both required abortions for some people and prohibited abortions for other people. So Nazis were both re, you know, pro-abortion and anti-abortion at the same time because it wasn't about, you know, it wasn't the, the argument that we're having today. It's a completely different um, context for the debate. They were not talking about, you know, whether it's uh, a, a sin to, you know, kill a fetus they were talking about whether that fetus would be a valuable member of society or not. And if that fetus were deemed to be valuable, you were not allowed to abort it. If the fetus was deemed to be not valuable, you must abort it. So it's, it's, it's almost like a complete disconnect when people raise, um, when people raise this Nazi history to talk about things today, if they, if they don't have the context of how the Nazi debates actually played out. Um, Linda, I wonder, um, could you tell us about, um, I want to hear some positive stories here. We've, uh, we've, we've talked a lot about things that are, you know, pretty depressing. Um, what do you find to be uh, a, a positive approach or a way to bring this to the classroom that really works, that resonates with people, that, um, that leaves them not feeling like, oh my gosh, I, I come up to this new profession, which has this terrible legacy, um, and, it, and instead, you know, leave the room thinking, well, that's something that we are using now to learn from and build from. And um, I, I'm, I guess I'm rambling, but I'm just curious, how, how do you approach this in a way that doesn't leave people feeling depressed about the profession that they are entering? Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and that's something I struggled with for a long time, just not even depressed about the profession they're going into, but depressed because of the class and sort of a secondary trauma. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I do is I try to empower students. And so I've done different things, different years, whether it's my course on the Holocaust, course on genocide and terrorism, um, or women, global human rights. Uh, and what I do is sometimes I'll have service learning projects where they go out in the community uh, and they can pick their volunteer operation. And what I communicate with them is that you may not be able to fix the most horrible thing you see in the world, but you can make small changes that will make a difference. So I try to give them tools, whether it's that or there's various peace projects I do. Um, you know, teaching how to write a letter to the editor, an effective blog to uh, raise a political issue. And one of the most gratifying things that I find in teaching about the Holocaust is I'll have a, a room full of students and sometimes they're taking it because it fits their schedule or they just need those three credit hours for their major. Uh, or sometimes I get individuals that I sometimes refer to as trauma tourists. They're hoping to sit there and watch horrible film after horrible film. Uh, and instead I take it back to what the US was doing, what was going on in the UK and other regions uh, and put it into context. You know, the, the Holocaust, it was, eugenics was part of the zeitgeist. You know, colonial ideas, absolutely part of the zeitgeist. And what's gratifying is to see them start to make those connections and see how it plays out today. And where they then may want to get politically involved in working to make a difference in the world. The other thing I would say is that occasionally I have students who are refugees or their parents may have been refugees, say from the, the, the genocide of the Bosnian communities. Um, we have a, a large Bosnian community here in St. Louis and they start to see the connections and understanding what perhaps their parents or grandparents, uh, now their grandparents, lived through. And uh, it's very meaningful to them that in some ways they're not alone that this has happened to other people. And it's not just blips on the radar of some unusual evil gone amok, um, but part of what humanity uh, is capable of doing if we don't attend to things such as human rights and social justice. Yeah, I will say one of my favorite programs we've done as part of this Holocaust Remembrance um, set of events was a few years ago, we had two child survivors of the Holocaust uh, who had escaped Europe um, after losing family and so on. Um, and two adolescents who had recently escaped Syria and Iraq. And the four of them had a conversation together about their experiences, shared and different, right? Some were similar, some were different. Um, but it was just incredibly powerful and a reminder, as you say, Linda, that these are things that continue to happen in some instances. Um, and of course, there are roles that health professionals play today in detection of abuse in detention centers, for example, that are critically important. Darcy, what's your, um, what's your, I don't know if it's the right way to put this, favorite way of engaging students in a way that, that leaves them feeling a little more empowered and a little less um, distressed by this history? Um, so I think, you know, fortunately reminding students that sometime over the last 70 to 100 years, nursing as a profession, we really shifted our um, allegiance away from physicians and on to patients. Um, so to really remind students that um, first and foremost, our obligation is to patients and specifically to respect the human dignity of every single person who's in front of you. Um, I, for, you know, for, for students who are not yet nurses, they're not yet out there working as nurses. Um, I think it's important to spend time, however, acknowledging that that's not always easy. Um, so, you know, part of my CV, I, I do a lot of research with workplace violence. It's not always easy to be super compassionate and you know, respect, <laughs> respectful of people when they're being really nasty to you. 
So, so those are, I think, really important conversations to have that, that yes, our primary obligation is respect and dignity for human beings. And how can we do that even in these really difficult situations? So now, you know, a, a perfect opportunity is this idea of, you know, unvaccinated patients, you know, need to be or deserve to be maybe treated differently. So, so working through some of those actual, you know, when they're in a, a situation, how can some of this become real and important and reframing everything to, to human dignity? Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, Mathis, do you have tips or tricks that you've used in terms of bringing this history home in a way that feels more productive than uh, distressful? Yeah, I would say that in general, teaching the history of medicine and the history of science is mostly a very positive story. So I find it very important to, to remember the, the dark chapters as well. Um, as you mentioned in your presentation, in Germany, there, was, there were pretty solid rules on human subject experimentation already at the very beginning of the 20th century. But then, of course, in the, in the horrible experiments in the concentration camps, Germany fell back behind that. And I think we need to remember that even after the Nuremberg doctor's trial and the Nuremberg code in many countries around the world for many decades, um, human subject research fell behind that. And still, still rules on human experimentation are are evolving. So I think it's quite necessary in a history that is often very positive, be it the history of the surgical revolution, the history of um, medication for psychi psychiatric disorders, even the, the history of, of biomedical ethics. It's very important to, to remember that e in this positive story, we must always make an effort not to fall back behind what we already know. I think a way to make this history accessible to students is to confront them with people, with places, with professions that are close to them. When I talk to my dental students about um, dentists who were forced out of the profession, I talk about somebody who had a practice here in Düsseldorf in a street that the students know who was a dentist, what is, which is what they want to become, and who was a member of the same football club that they are watching on TV still. So I think this is quite, quite important. That's very interesting. And thank you for raising the point that there is so much that is positive about the history of medical and dental and psychology. All of our professional backgrounds have a great deal to be proud of. Um, and it, this needs to be couched within that you know, uh, story as well. Um, there was a, a good question raised in the Q&A that I think, Linda, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, which is around the linkage um, between race and disability, and especially between race and what is deemed intellectual disability. And I wonder how you approach that um, intersection. I think it was interesting because when uh, um, we were learning about, you know, dental care receiving less attention than medical care, and I think mental health care must be at the bottom of the list. <laughs> uh, and too often, individuals who Black, Latinx, Indigenous have been defined as mentally ill or mentally defective. Um, based simply on stereotype. Uh, and someone who is white would have gotten a very different diagnosis and perhaps received treatment of some sort uh, that was needed. Um, I think it's also in terms of, you know, individuals who experience chronic oppression, uh, chronic poverty, uh, chronic trauma are gonna have, a, you know, uh, exhibit elements of post-traumatic stress. And yet we don't define that as a normal response to an abnormal situation. We define them as defective and disabled and less than in some ways. So 
I think there's clear connections uh, and overlap there, but I don't know how much it's been uh, adequately explored. Because we even see with ideas of just raising issues of slavery and critical race theory, the current backlash in the United States against that. Mm -hmm. So the idea that somehow we, we can, you know, so there's, there's not a lot of support right now to look at some of these issues. So I'm not sure I answered your question. Um, well, I think, no, I think you did actually, because the, um, the question is, you know, what do, what do we, how do we manage the intersectionality of talking about race and talking about especially intellectual disability, where I think earlier you mentioned the IQ test and, you know, the ways in which these, these um, definitions of what counts as disabled um, are in some ways political decisions. Yeah, and some of these issues have gone before the Supreme Court. You know, can you base whether someone gets tracked in a particular educational program solely on the basis of an IQ test? The Supreme Court, I don't remember the year, but I believe it was in the 1970s said, no, you can't do that anymore. But you know, if you pair it with other tests, I am sure that it's still used as a tool of bias. And we all know that there are many professions where you go through a variety of cognitive ability tests, et cetera, who have, which have been normed on a different population and still remain biased. Um, uh, so the history is there. And it's one of those things that, you know, I mentioned the APA apology resolutions and the areas that are worked on. One of the things that's in those is that we're gonna start really looking at, you know, how these tests and tools are used. And we can expand it from IQ tests to things like the ACT and the SAT and the MCAT and the LSAT uh, and how those tests were normed but are biased against particular populations. So it looks like those admissions policies are fair when mm -hmm. in fact they're not. Uh, and so um, it's gonna take work because some of these are big bucks industries. There's no doubt about that, you know, any sort of psychometrics, there's money there. Uh, and it makes it difficult to challenge the industries that are using those. Yeah. Um, Darcy, I, I may be uh, asking you to repeat a little bit what you were going at before, but I, I want to ask the question I asked before about how do you, um, how do you help people through this history without... Um, without causing them to be depressed. I think the other thing that can happen it, with this history is people may be traumatized by it. Um, and I'm wondering if you have ways of teaching or approaching this, or do you give people a trigger warning? We've, we, within our own program, we've gone back and forth on a couple of these issues. You know, what images to show, whether to show images that were taken by perpetrators, uh, and I'm just wondering if I could hear from all three of you, perhaps, on this set of issues around how to teach this in a way that is sensitive to the fact that it is a traumatic history that we're talking about. Um, I definitely give trigger warnings for sure um, when we're about to to have these conversations. Um, I also very much try to, because as I mentioned, I don't know, <laughs> for whatever reason, it, in my courses, these discussions always end up after our discussion about, you know, the Holocaust in particular, our discussions inevitably, to Linda's point there, end up with race. Um, so yeah. it, it sort of becomes an opportunity to talk about race and race relations and racism. Um, so letting, in the same way, sort of cueing students that we're probably gonna be talking about things um, like racism, that some people in the classroom have been very hurt by racism in their own very personal histories. Um, and to be mindful of that, for all, all of us to be mindful of that. Um, so we definitely have conversations about, you know, this is kind of what's coming and where our conversation may take us to things that that hit us personally. And um, we need to be respectful of, of everybody's thoughts and opinions and experiences. I don't know if that answers. 
Yeah, uh, it does. Um, Mathis, what do you do uh, when you're embarking on teaching this material? Are there, do you give a, a warning? We're about to have a very sensitive conversation. Um, do you avoid showing certain images? Mm, I don't give trigger warnings when I lecture in the classroom because I think that the students know when I will be talking about medicine during National Socialism or dentistry during National Socialism that there will be tough topics coming up and all of them have at least high school education on the topic so they they know what's coming. Um, I think that it can be a bit of a traumatizing history, but then on the other hand, medical and dental students will also deal with a lot of other traumatizing issues. People um, with severe diseases, um, patients at the end of life, things like that. So I think in most instances, they can handle the teaching. The, the one exception that I would want to make is every once in a while, I, I'm organizing field trips and I've taken students to Hadamar, including a visit to the actual gas chamber in crematoria, to Berlin, including concentration campsites, to Poland, including extermination campsites. And when we meet to prepare these field trips, of course, I tell them that seeing the actual places might be tough for them and tougher than they imagine. Because even for me, and I've been to many of these places, to many of them several times, even for me, it's quite tough. And I tell them if they need some air, some time, of course, they are free to take the time. Um, I'm not a psychologist, but I offer to talk with them if they want to. And I make sure to go to the bar with them at the end of the night. And I hope that having a pint will help them in the same way it might help me at the end of a tough day. Mm -hmm. I think another aspect that we are discussing in Germany, especially, is should we name the victims? Should we show their faces? I, I noticed in your presentation you were blocking out the face of a person being murdered, I think. Um, in the past, we wouldn't have given the full first and last name of victims, for example, of uh, patient murders in the, in the context of euthanasia. But in the last maybe only five years or so, I think the discourse has shifted in part because of Paul Weindling's very strong position on the issue that we should give back identity and names to those who had been victimized by the Nazi regime and um, giving back faces, personalities, names to people might help us remember them better. And I think the discourse in Germany at least is shifting in that direction. And I think I would today um, follow this discourse and try to show people and maybe not only show them as, as patients, but try to talk a little bit about the history, try to illustrate that they had a life before they became a patient or before they became a victim, and then try to, to commemorate them as a full human being. Yeah, that's exactly the conversation we've had. And uh, Linda and I had this conversation two weeks ago around whether to show the faces of victims when they were not in charge of taking that picture. Um, and that was, that's one of the things I've changed is I, I blocked out some of the faces uh, where previously I have not for the reasons you mentioned, but I have to say, I am still undecided on what the right thing to do is. Linda, how do you think about these issues of um, respect and trauma and, um, do you, do you do trigger warnings? Which, by the way, Mathis, you are uh, very lucky in one sense that you can assume a certain level of knowledge about this history from your students walking in. That is, unfortunately, just not the case in the U.S. Um, there are many students graduate high school here and do not know the Holocaust happened. Yeah, I, I did a, a survey years ago, uh, and I added two questions. Um, 
you know, it's on a Likert scale, one to five, strongly agree to strongly disagree. Uh, do you believe it's the possible that the Holocaust didn't happen? Uh, and do you believe it's possible that the Holocaust has been exaggerated? And while most individuals seem to strongly agree that it happened, where I found is that a lot of people, um, and I did this over two universities, uh, believed that it was actually exaggerated, uh, which was very distressing. Our level of Holocaust education in this country is uh, minimal at best. And I don't know if you saw today's news that the school board in Tennessee has banned the use and removed from the library the book Mouse. Hmm. Um, because they, they said it, because of offensive content. Um, so in terms of getting back to your question, um, it isn't that I, I, I have sort of a general warning in my syllabus that we're gonna be talking about really just, you know, difficult things and, um, you know, it may raise feelings and feel free to, to come and talk to me. I also warn them not to read before they go to bed because then they'll dream. <laughs> about it, it just seems like a really simple thing, but I think it makes a difference to a lot of students. Uh, I often have a lot of you know, 18 to 22 year olds. Uh, and so I always make sure that you know, they realize, recognize what services we have on campus because it isn't so much that the material itself necessarily will cause a secondary trauma, but it may tap into trauma that they haven't dealt with. So if they've come from a home where they're abused or you know, war veterans coming back. We have a lot of military. Um, sometimes they may not recognize that, you know, this is going to tap into their experiences in Iraq or Afghanistan uh, or wherever they may have served around the globe. So I try to provide that information and let them know that there are resources for them. Uh, I actually worry more about the students who are just sort of numb because of all the video games that they've played and the violent television, you know, movies that they watched. That I remember one student I, I had shown a, a, you know, a survivor made video, and uh, she talks about you know, and students were clearly affected, but it was like, ah, eh, that's nothing, you know. I've seen far worse, you know, on TV. That worries me more. Um, Lynn Perry just put in a question I'd love to get your thoughts on, which is um, sort of moving back from the individual impact of teaching about this history to the social impact of teaching about this history. Uh, we've all, in one way or another, referred to issues of implicit type bias or colonialism or paternalism, these sort of big picture constructs that are really baked into society in many ways. Um, are there ways in which knowledge of this history we anticipate to impact those bigger picture, you know, what's baked into society type um, things? Or do you have examples where you've seen that happen, where institutional policies have changed or anything like that as a result of reflection about this history and maybe a recognition that, you know, something is on the wrong track right now? I don't have one of you to call on, but just if anyone has an example. Yeah, I'll pipe in real quick. Um, and I can't say uh, necessarily as a direct result of this history, but as very relevant history, as, as a re very relevant piece of this history. Um, and I, I actually wanted to ask you from other disciplines, if this is happening in your discipline as well. In nursing, there has been a, a shift in, you know, for, for, a good decade or two, we've been teaching about social determinants of health and race as a social determinant of health. We have definitely shifted to not discussing race as a biological concept, but as a social construct. And I mean, it's that alone is you can literally watch students' heads practically explode because they've never even thought about race as a social construct as opposed to being a biological realism. Mm. So kind of unwinding that, first of all, and no longer talking about race as a determinant of health, but racism as a determinant of health. Because if race doesn't exist as a biological realism, it can't really be a predictor of health. So what is the predictor there? So we're shifting our language from, from race to, in, in, like in that context, from race to racism 
as being the the issue. I was curious if that's happening in any yeah. other. Yeah, well, that's certainly happening in medical training. Um, the the shift from recognizing uh, race as something that affects your health outcomes and movement towards experiences that you have as a result of your race, i.e. racism experiences, that's what ends up having a long-term adverse impact on health far more often than any genetic, you know, component. And of course, you know, in, in medicine, I assume in nursing and psychology and dentistry as well, there is a recognition that there are diseases that that roughly correspond with races, right? Where people from certain ethnic racial groups are more likely to have certain Ill illnesses. Um, but that's not what describes, you know, the disproportionate impact of hypertension or the more frequent experience of renal failure, right? Those are not driven by genetics in nearly so much as they are driven by social experiences of what it's like to be you know, a black person in the United States, that kind of thing. Linda, are you seeing something like that in psychology? Yes, certainly when it comes to issues of race, there's um, not only just addressing the history of racism and how psychology has helped shape that within the United States, uh, but there have been several uh, pushes for greater health equity for individuals and mental health equity. Uh, for individuals who are Black, Latinx, Indigenous, et cetera, uh, and working to increase the number of practitioners who are providing services. And how do we get more individuals into the pipeline so that if someone's you know, African-American and they want to see an African-American woman psychologist in their hometown, that there will be someone available and they don't have to travel two hours away. Uh, to a major city to find that individual. So I think there've been some real pushes for that. The other thing I would say is that, you know, APA is in the process of uh, rewriting their ethics code to create a new transformative ethics code, which will include more about human rights, social justice, interconnection between persons and peoples, respect not just for persons, but respect for peoples as well. Um, and, so it's moving beyond just a very small, you know, focus just on the individual, but how social issues impact individuals and their communities and the groups and the organizations where they work. There's a, a really, uh, I think, important couple questions just popped up in the Q&A. So I want to try and hit them if we can before we run out of time. One is a political issue, but this is a panel about teaching a topic that has political implications and around which there are strong feelings. Um, what do you do when teaching about the Holocaust brings up um, anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Palestinian, um, right? The whole, that whole conflict may end up coming up in your classroom. Any, any thoughts on managing that uh, and the sort of politics of um, bringing this history forward um, and thinking about contemporary, uh, you know, dynamics today. Um, I know this has come up when I teach. What do, what do you all do when that comes up? Um, Mathis, maybe you can go first. So in the German context, I think we see very little Holocaust denial, actually. And the students in medical school, in dental school that I see, even if they would disagree, they would probably just shut up and sit in the back of the room. So it would be, would be uncommon to see somebody debating. But what could happen is that some students out of curiosity are asking, can we actually compare Nazi medical crimes with other medical crimes, with um, experimentation without the consent of the subjects or with doctors being involved in torture or um, other eugenic practices before or after Nazi Germany. And I think in, in these cases, it would be important to have an open discussion and ask the students um, which aspects are actually similar and which aspects are different. And I think you have to 
look very closely at the situation. I think that, for example, um, the German sterilization law is not that terribly different from other sterilization laws. I think the Germans were sterilizing a larger proportion of their population, but the ideas behind the law, um, the practices were quite similar. There are other instances that are very, very different. For example, the murder of psychiatric and neurological patients was very, very different than what we saw in other countries. And um, in Germany, once about every 20 years or so, we have a debate on if you can compare the Holocaust to other genocides. And we are having one debate right now that is asking the question if there are causal connections between the experience of colonialism and the Holocaust. And there are some very smart people, including Hannah Arendt, who saw some connections, but right now that is a very big debate in Germany. And I think it's important to have the debate if people want to have it and to very closely look at what you are comparing. You can compare maybe concentration camps in, in Namibia to concentration camps in Germany before the beginning of the war, but you cannot compare them to extermination camps in occupied Eastern Europe, for example. Um, and I think you need to, to have a rather fine grained historical analysis. And maybe with this kind of analysis, you can even convince some people of when it's appropriate and when it's not to compare. Yeah, I will say that um, that fine-grained analysis is made more challenging when you don't have a relatively high level of understanding of the history to start with, right? I think I would. I haven't seen uh, a survey on this, but I would guess that if you surveyed most Americans, they would not see that there is a difference between a concentration camp, a labor camp, a hybrid camp, and an extermination center. They're all Nazi concentration camps. Um, Darcy, has this come up in your teaching? Uh, do you get you know Israel-Palestinian conflicts showing up in your classroom? No, I have not ever. Um, and as has already been pointed out, I suspect it's a reflection of our knowledge in the U.S. of this history in general. Yeah. So, no, I haven't. Linda, what about you? Has the has this brought up sort of uh, contemporary politics? We could certainly talk more about the the ways in which the politics of the pandemic have been sometimes appropriate and misappropriated uh, language around the Holocaust, which was mentioned earlier. But um, but the questioner was asking specifically about pro Israel, pro Palestine sort of conflicts showing up in the classroom. Yeah, I think that issue has. It's certainly come up at times. Um, and what I endeavor to do is just be very respectful in listening to people and, and marrying that respect and, and expecting that respect for each other in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, we often come up in psychology with people who say things that are filled with all sorts of misinformation and myth about psychology. So we're sort of used to dealing with, you know, if they say something that is blatantly bizarre, you know, um, that we can ask them for their sources and can we get more information about that? Um, I, I think in terms of uh, you know, issues related to, to Palestine, I, I remember I was going at a conference one time and someone came up to me and said, oh, you teach about the Holocaust. You know, I support the other side. And this is a PhD psychologist. I was like, what? I mean, I didn't expect someone to come up at a conference and say, oh, I'm a Nazi. But then he said, I support the Palestinians. And I said, I support both. I support both for human, human rights for both. And what we're dealing with is a government who's enacted policies that personally, I degree, disagree with that have caused harm to other individuals and uh, have led to um, you know, structural and institutional forms of biases that, you know, uh, reduce well-being in general for individuals who live in the Palestinian territories for the most part. So, you know, I ask for their information, 
what what I deal with more often is when someone just says something off the cuff and they think it's true. You know, well, we know that Jews have money and they control the media. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, because they've just heard it so many times that they don't even they don't even question it. And so we stop and and really look at is that an, a valid assumption? Uh, can we can we take that as a given and as a truth? And there's certainly a lot of people who teach psychology who have provided all kinds of information about difficult dialogues and constructive conversations and how to have those in the classroom. And so I would urge individuals to really look at those materials so you're sort of prepared before you walk into the classroom because things are going to come up. Students will say just about anything. And then I think we can squeeze in one last question, which is from uh, Jeremy Lazarus. Uh, You've spoken to students, but I assume you've also given talks to practicing professionals and sort of everything in the training uh, spectrum. Do you find that there is a point in someone's life course where they are more uh, receptive to learning about this history and to and to trying to inculcate it into um, contemporary thinking and decision making? I'll start with Mathis. I'm not quite sure about the life course of an individual, but I'm quite sure that in Germany, at least, you can see that it has to do with a couple of generations of distance from the war. We could see that in the post-war era, not many people want to hear about Nazi crimes, and even when, when some uh, TV documentaries like uh, Holocaust were first screened in the 1970s, that caused a big social uproar, I would want to say. And then you can see starting um, from the student generation of 1968, you get some young people questioning what were our parents doing, um, and with the medical professions being quite conservative, at least in Germany, um, it took even longer. It took until all the people who had been active before 1945 being well out of the picture um, before medical specialists. Um, so association where people ask about the past and and how how they relate to it. So I would say that it took two or three generations before they were interested in that. I think talking about individuals, I think as soon as the students that I teach actually see patients, they become very interested in medical ethics suddenly. Oh. And some of them find find the history of medicine, the history of dentistry, useful to learning about ethical aspects and some don't. Very interesting. Ours, uh, our, this material tends to come in the preclinical years, I think, in, in the U.S. Um, but uh, Darcy, what do you think? Is there a time in the life course of a nurse that, where they're most receptive to learning this history? Um, uh, I, I can't say. Um, I would say that in my experience, it's more related to kind of content and audience. Um, so, you know, for example, if, if we're like in the context of a psychiatric mental health course, then, you know, this kind of T4 wild euthanasia history and conversations that come from that are very applicable. Um, and for, you know, advanced practice, advanced practice nurses who are studying, you know, genetics and genomics, then it, you know, it's a little yeah. different conversation about, okay, here's the history of eugenics, eugenics in America, eugenics, um, you know, in the context of the Holocaust and, you know, how is this applicable today? Um, and then I've also had conversations, you know, with, with nurse educators, you know, how might you incorporate some of this and practicing nurses framing more this history, like what can we learn about things like stigmatization and um, how the, the role of stigmatization in the delivery of healthcare. 
Yeah. It's more about content and audience for me personally. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point and a very good way to wrap up the session. Thank you all so much for joining us. This has been a really terrific conversation about learning from each other, about how to handle and manage and teach and learn from this very complex, difficult history. Um, thank you for joining us.